Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in our virtual world today. My name is Ron Dagdag, and today I will be talking about developing Spidey Senses anomaly detection for JavaScript applications. All right, uh, before anything else, I got my shirt here about Spy Spider Man, and you know, it's my shirt says, Spy you know, my. Spidey senses are tingling, especially when I'm, you know, starting a presentation, you know, that that feeling of that tingling sensation and getting everybody round up. And, you know, that's that feels like a spidey sense to me, right? That tingling sensation in the back of Peter Parker's skull. If you haven't heard of Peter Parker and Spider-Man, uh, most likely, uh, most likely you've seen some of the videos and movies and reboots and all that. Uh, the ability, it's his ability to to detect danger, and and uh, be able to detect you know clones or detect evil. It, it also helps him uh, when he is impaired find the secret passageways. You know, it's just it's just one of those things that makes Spider Man Spider Man. <laughs> it's his Spidey senses, and of course, you know, before Spidey senses, you know, the real Spider sense is uh, you know from 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 spiders this they we call it hyper awareness uh, and it, this long thin hairs that they have it's called trichobothria uh, that can detect low level of vibrations through their web and it, it, it can even uh, you know it can even uh, detect sounds and even small insects moving up to three meters away so that's it's amazing uh, spiders are really amazing creatures and of course, you know, it gives me heebie-jeebies just watching their little, <laughs> little long thing hairs. And of course, you know, we are a lot of us here are web developers. And you know, when you're starting as a web developer, you're shooting <laughs> your web out there, and nothing happens. And you have a, and you're aiming for 200k, right, <laughs> to get to get your website going. So Spidey senses is that gut feel, right? That that vibe and that feeling that makes uh, someone that's even an expert know, uh, you know, if you think about, uh, if you think about a basketball player and it, it's in, they intuitively know where, to, where the, the ball is and how to shoot it properly. It's, you know, it's what they learned and how much they practiced in the past that makes, that makes them build that spidey senses. And that's what's interesting about it is it's that, uh, you know, it helps us discover sometimes the blind spots. And, and today we're going to be talking about anomaly detection, which I think it's, you know, it's detecting what's, uh, it's it's like spidey senses. And we're going to talk about time series anomaly detection. We'll do a little bit of demo and we'll take it away. So anomaly detection is identifying unexpected items in your data set that's different from the norm. Sometimes we call anomaly detection as an outlier. You know, we live in this pandemic times and we live in these weird times that you know, we usually meet uh, you know, locally or we, we meet at an event. Now it's all virtual. So that's in a way an outlier. Uh, so the assumptions are for an anomaly detection is anomalies only occur very rarely in your data and their features differ from normal instances significantly. And you'll, we'll talk more about these uh, as we go through the presentation. So what are the causes of outliers? It's either artificial or non-natural, and of course the other way is natural. Artificial causes could be data entry errors, and this is very common, you know, 100,000 versus 1 million, that extra zero makes a whole lot of difference. Uh, you know, Measurement errors, and also another one where you know we're talking about how uh, we measure things, so maybe inches and in, uh, you know metric system versus English system. So that that's can cause uh, outliers. Experimental errors when you start collecting your data at the later the sprint instead of collecting all through. Uh, in, intentional outliers. Uh, this is kind of like asking on um, you know uh, high school students if they. Under you know under reporting of alcohol consumption, that might be a good example of an intentional outlier. Uh, 
a data processing error when we extract ETL, when you extract from one data source to another data source as you transfer it, sometimes there might be some uh, communication errors or the way we, uh, we transfer the data might have some errors. Sampling errors also, uh, where you kind of identify, you know, in this case, the height of all athletes. You're, you know, it's a report about height of all athletes, and but you only included mostly basketball players that would skew your data, and that might be a sampling error. And of course, natural errors. I mean, it's not one of the artificial ones that uh, might cross when occurs in in nature. So what we're trying to do here is you have your stream of data or you have your input data, you're passing through this gate, right? Is it an anomalies, anomaly data, anomalous data or not? And sometimes, of course, you know, you won't be able to detect all of them. So you think about the blank ones here are good data and one, the ones that it says defective or defective data. Sometimes you would detect them most of the time, maybe, but sometimes you may, might miss them. So it, it can happen. But as much as possible, we want to improve our, our algorithms uh, to be able to do this. One good saying uh, about anomaly detection is, you know, it's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack. If the needle is that big, it definitely can find it. But if it's if it rarely occurs, it, you know, sometimes it's harder. It's a harder problem to solve. So different methods and how you would uh, do uh, anomaly detection. It could be a rule-based system. Statistic, you might want to do statistical techniques, or you can use machine learning. Rule-based systems, most likely you've done this or you've worked on it if you're a developer, is when you specify the rules or assign a certain thresholds or limit to your data uh, to identify you know, what's out of whack. Right? The, the problem with the rule-based system or disadvantage of using a rule-based system is you know, you need experts of the industry to detect what is, you know, what is common problem and what's, you know, what's the normal anomalies, the known anomalies. And of course, you know, the pattern does not, does not change or does not adapt, you know, as your data changes and it, it, will, it won't adapt, especially when you have seasonal data. And, you know, it might require some data labeling. You have to require an industry expert to look at your data set and to identify and then you can you can specify the rules in your program another way is through statistical techniques statistical techniques would be something like uh you know you calculate the median or the mode or you can you know use or rolling averages or moving averages if you're you know stock investor you see those graphs and they have those uh they sometimes they use statistical techniques and when to buy when to sell and you're trying to get out of the norm that to kind of identify, hey, this stock is going to shut up, and that, those kind of things. And that kind of gives you a statistical technique algorithm. For sensors, or for IoT data, sometimes you might be working with, uh, you know, what they call common filters. So, so the sensor information is giving you a lot of noise and to kind of give you a low pass filter to, to kind of identify which of the data set are Going to be thrown and which one is going to be passed through uh, your system of course you know there's a lot more the advantage of statistical techniques would that it's easy to interpret i mean someone can calculate uh the the median or mode or some statistical uh, property and sometimes it's more useful than machine learning methods so if you're if you can put it in a formula that you can you can identify all these anomalies, then it might make sense to use statistical techniques. Of course, for machine learning method, you know, there might be way, uh, there might be capabilities where you, you might, you can do it as a supervised learning, uh, identify, you know, hot dog, not hot dog, that type of, uh, you know, where you would use decision tree, uh, you know, and also another way is unsupervised learning. Uh, unsupervised learning is when you're kind of looking at, uh, being able to to kind of you know they talk about k means or clustering and those kind of things and of course there's the self supervised where you would use uh, an auto encoder to do this okay uh, one of the things you have to consider uh, if you're going to do you know anomaly detection versus supervised learning which one you know 
because both of them you're trying to identify uh, which is anomalous or not. In supervised learning, you're you know, you're, you're also looking at it in terms of you know uh, being able to identify uh, through classification. Uh, so if it's anomaly det anomaly detection techniques, you would use uh, if you have a very small number of positive examples and a large number of negative examples. And there are different types of, you know, sometimes it's harder to learn from positive examples. Maybe you have not discovered some of the uh, anomalies yet. So there are some anomaly detection techniques that might help you uh, as compared to a classification or supervised learning. Supervised learning is good if you have a large number of positive and negative examples that kind of equal them, you know, with your data set where it's enough positive example for, uh, for the algorithm to learn. And of course, the positive examples is kind of like the same as your training data set. So that's kind of makes a difference in how you would decide uh, how you would, you would uh, use uh, anomaly detection versus supervised learning. So anomaly detection would be something like fraud detection. You know, most likely you've experienced it when you have a credit card and suddenly the credit card doesn't work because it's out of the area where you usually buy. Uh, that's you know, fraud detection that they're kind of looking into, the banks are looking into. Uh, manufacturing, if you have a machine that, you know, going through the, its process and some, sometimes it's uh, being able to, to identify uh, if the machine is getting some errors and that might be an anomaly. Data, they use this for data centers also, identifying, you know, which servers are failing. So it would be a good capability or looking at the logs. I've seen, uh, you know, those uh, observability tools lately that have ha incorporating anomaly detection in their, uh, in their systems. And of course, Internet of Things would be a good example where you would need anomaly detection. Supervised learning would be more of an, you know, you would use it for email spam classification or a weather prediction. The reason why you would kind of do email spam classification because there's a lot of examples out there uh, as you know, you can identify. Uh, cancer classification because there's experts that already know what they're looking for. So it makes sense to have it as a supervised learning algorithm compared to, to anomaly detection. So machine, machine learning, sometimes you might do uh, density-based anomaly detection. Uh, sometimes it's clustering-based, you know, where uh, anything outside of that cluster that's considered anomalies. You know, so this is normal data and this is outside data or, you know, anom anomalous data. So sometimes it's uh, nearest neighbor or sometimes it's clustering. Or sometimes it's Gaussian, you, you, you know, there's that distribution uh, that you would calculate and anything outside of that uh, Gaussian distribution can be considered anomalous. So there, you know, and then sometimes it's uh, support vector machines where you kind of split your data into two, you sp split you know, your data set. So is it in this area, that means it's normal, anything outside of that line, it's anomalous, those kind of things. So there's what I'm trying to get at here, I'm got going deeper into what are different techniques and how you would do anomaly detection. There's a lot of algorithms out there that you can use to be able to, to do this. Uh, one of, I would like to kind of do a little demo on where you can uh, do anomaly detection. The simplest one that I found uh, is using the stat analysis. There's uh, a node package manager called, uh, it's called this stats analysis. So you do NPM install. Right now, guys, I'm just showing this to you using Python notebooks because it's just easier to to kind of explain and rerun my code as we go. And so, but either way, it's running, a, this Python notebook is uh, actually running a TypeScript kernel. So it can run JavaScript application in the background. So in this case, you know, I do requires that analysis. I have a series of data and we know the last data is, you know, an outlier or an anomaly. So what there's this program that would just say, okay, just, you know, take out the outliers out, the, out here in this data set. And then it will return you the, all the ones that are in its range. And it's based from 
course, you know, looking at all the series of data and figure out that's what is outside of it. So that's the simplest example I can show that's running in JavaScript. Let's move forward. All right. Internet of Things, of course, it's my favorite topic. You know, it happens because you know, sensors are getting cheaper. There's more volume that we're collecting. You know, if you think about your phone, there's a lot of data that's being collected from your phone, collecting you know, at your homes and all that because it, the sensors are getting cheaper. And of course, data speeds, sending it up to the network or the machines are getting better processing these. Uh, that's, that's why Internet of Things is here. But the thing is, there's some, you know, some, there are some things that you know, as we explore, ex expand the capabilities of our, our IoT data, the data is, you know, moves moving fast. But when when something goes wrong, it frustrates the user, or it's it's frustrating to use. You, know, you think about, you know, my you know, Google TV I have at home, and I sometimes it, you know, if I can't use it, it's just frustrating if I can't use my, uh, you know, my. Google Home and those kind of things, or Google Voice or some, some of those things, right? And if when it's broken, it feels something like this, <laughs> trying to find where in my pipeline that that's broken. Uh, and so, and it gets frustrating and it's hard to find. And that's where I'm kind of talking about where, you know, internet uh, anomaly detection, it might be useful for, uh, for these type of uh, uh, application. And more and more I've seen uses of JavaScript or node bots or however you would call uh, these JavaScript application that actually connects to your, uh, to your Internet of Things device. And so time series anomaly types. There are different types of uh, anomaly. Time series, when I talk about time series, that means you have, you know, component of time in each each version or each each item on your on your uh, list is you know the values I'll, I'll show more yeah. so if you think about this right uh, you have your uh, time component and then the value around that time component so you think about it's your temperature at your home a certain temperature and then suddenly it spiked up and then it spiked down and then it, back you know the normal you know and this is an outlier uh, so that's another way is a spike and level shift where it's suddenly you know it's running this way and then suddenly it went up most likely your ac is down that's why the temperature of your home is suddenly higher those kind of things or like these kind of where you have the patterns certain patterns of your data and then and then it suddenly changes the, the levels. That's a spike and level shift. Another one is pattern change. So you think about the flow of water, and then suddenly, you know, you know, most likely if you're, you know, gardening and you have your hose, and then suddenly someone stepped on the hose, and then the water that's spouting is spitting out and ha is is less. That's uh, there's a pattern change right there in your data set. And of course, seasonality. You know, we all know of certain times of the year that sales are up. You know, if ice cream sales are up or pizza sales are up, ice cream sales are up is higher during the summer. Or pizza sales is during uh, uh, what you call these uh, football season or you know the, the uh, Super Bowl. That's, that's what uh, typically happens. So there's seasonality in your data that you have to consider. So if you're doing anomaly detection, you have to to think about that. Uh, seasonality. And of course, you know, I did talk about production issues and you have production issues, especially if you're streaming data, you know, you got to find, you know, it's kind of like a stopping a, a train. And when we talk about, uh, you know, time series data, you'll hear more about this IID data set, identically distributed and independent, identically distributed that means the distribution does not fluctuate. It came from the same probability distribution. So if you look at this roulette, it came from the same source, right? Uh, it's the same roulette that you're 
picking your data. Uh, another one is independent. Uh, that means you throw the ball and you throw it again and throw again in each round and you you measure. So if you think about the temperature in your house, the data that when you grab the temperature is not based from the previous data set. It's all you know getting the sensor data, reading reading the sensor data, and then you're adding it to your to your list or you're adding it to your database. You read your sensor data again, you add it to your database. They're independent from each other. All right. And of course, when you do anomaly detection in a time series data, you have to, to figure out if it's a univariate versus multivariate. Univariate, that means there's only one variable that you're tracking. So in this case, if you're looking at sales data uh, and you're figuring out, the, you know, like in this case, uh, this is your sales data went down and then went up, and this can be anomalous not so that's it's just one univariate multivariate is you have multiple variables that you're tricky uh, that you're you're tracking like in this case there's vibration temperature pressure velocity of of your data set and you're trying to identify from that area is this you know based from those variables all at the same time at that period of time you know is it anomalous or not so that's when you have to consider where you, you you have to uh, look at multiple variables versus one variable. Time series anomaly detection, you know, in this case, we're looking at spikes and change points. Spikes is temporary burst. Change points is when, you know, you know, typically we talk about level changes and trends that you're trying to detect. All right, so just to kind of visualize what we're talking about, uh, I think about it this way. So I have this device. Like let's say this is a, a you know a machine that you're detecting uh, anomalies, and you know it runs back and forth. It stops after a while, runs back and forth, and this anomaly detector is looking at the historical data from here to here to identify if that last item is anomalous or not. In this case, it was detected. Hey, there. That is an anomaly. It's expecting it's supposed to be around this area, but there was a sudden dip. So that, that means that is an anomaly. Should you send a, an alert or you should, you know, and it's up to you to, to, to figure out what, what causes that anomaly. But at least it, it becomes obvious uh, once you, uh, you figure that out, or once it's, it's reading that streaming set of data. Okay, uh, one one of the easiest way on how we can we can do anomaly detection is using Azure Cognitive Services. Uh, it's a it's AI for every developer without machine learning expertise. So in Azure Cognitive Services, there's different types. You can talk about speech, vision, web search, language. Uh, it's just an API call. As a developer, it just makes it easier for us to integrate anomaly detection in our application and one of the uh, one of the exact or one of the items that they have as part of anomaly detection uh, Azure cognitive services is this anomaly detector there's also personalizer this is more uh, for uh, personalized experiences there's also content moderator uh, to uh, to kind of uh, you know figure out what's the content but this we're going to today we're going to talk about anomaly detector. So anomaly detector is a RESTful API that, that can detect abnormalities with your data. It can identify what is the best fitting model without training, you know, without pre-training it. Uh, identify the boundaries of the anomaly detection you can. And it does not, the good thing about this, it does not need labeled training data. And you can still fight, fine tune. And it's really production ready because a lot of the Microsoft product teams are already using it, integrating it to their application. Uh, and and uh, it, I think it's amazing. Uh, the, one of the things that are in, currently in preview is a multivariate anomaly detection. That means you can, you can do multiple variables now. Uh, so uh, you can detect anomalies as a batch or you can do it real time. Uh, 
and of course, you know, you can get more information about your data because of that. And I'll do more demos about this. Sometimes it makes sense better that way. So what's happening in the back end is uh, once you send your data, it tries to extract the features and identify what algorithm it can use, right? If your data set has seasonality in it, you might use a you know, list of this algorithm, certain algorithms. If it does not, doesn't have seasonality, it automatically knows. And then it would use either coarse or fine granularity. And there's like different algorithms that they're currently using. If you ask me, I don't know how to implement all, each one of these. So it's you know, above my period, it's more, more advanced that I can, <laughs> that I can understand all these different algorithms that they, they do. But it allows us as a developer to quickly integrate it to our application. So let's do a quick demo on how we would we would do this. All right. Let's go back here. Let's do something simple, uh, the simplest one. So in this package, JSON, there's multiple dependencies. Uh, right now, the, the anomaly detector has these uh, JavaScript you know, package that NPM package that you can use into your application, uh, Azure uh, AI anomaly detector detector that you can integrate. So in this case, we'll we'll look at the univariate. Uh, if we have time, we'll look at the multivariate. Um, but I think I'm going to focus on this since we only have about 15 minutes or less about our presentation. So we'll focus on this. Um, this uh, sense hat. So what I have here, I have these uh, Raspberry Pi. Actually, by the way, this um, Python notebook uh, is actually running on this device. And if you haven't heard about Raspberry Pi, uh, it can run Node. It's a, it has an operating system. It has Linux operating system in it. And of course, it's not a it's not a 386. It's an ARM processor. The good thing about this. You know, there's, there's, uh, they call it this sense hat. This sense hat has these, you know, RGB colors and has temperature sensors, all these sensors that's on top of my Raspberry Pi right now. So that might, might make it easier for us to be able to, uh, to read some of sensor data. So you run a few things here. So, like in this case, I want to run, um, I'm using this. TS Lab. If you're not familiar with TS Lab, that's the one that allows me to have uh, to have these uh, Python notebook uh, running, or this Jupyter notebook having a TS Lab kernel or TypeScript kernel in the back end. Uh, so, in order for me to be able to read sensor data uh, for this sense hat device, uh, there is this Node sense hat an npm package that can control my LED device. So. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, so if I run it, it kind of clears my data set. So, so this allows me to read some of the sensor data. And if I want to read IMU data, so meaning you know, I want to read some the acceleration, the gyroscope that is on that on this device, I can use it to to give me the value uh, of these. You know, it also gives me the temperature, the pressure, and humidity in the room. So that's you know, there's so many simple commands that you can you can do. It has some libraries that how you can you can run it. Okay. Now on this one, uh, I want to collect time series data. You need two things in order to collect the time series data: a timestamp and a value. And I want to put it on this array uh, of entries, right? And this, what this one does is it would read the temperature data, okay? And, but uh, anomaly detector requires me to specify what is my granularity with my data if I submit it to the API. In this case, uh, the, the minimum that, that, it, that it requires me is the every minute. So every minute set of data. You can do hourly or weekly. You know, if you think about sales data, it could be yearly, annual data, or it could be monthly data. In this case, I want to get you know every minute data, 
and I want to round it up to the nearest minute because uh, for some reason it, it need it requires me to do something like that. So uh, I already run this a few minutes ago or this morning. Uh, see, it, it rounded up, you know, to the nearest minute and give me the value of my temperature around that time. And then of course, you know, I do a set interval. I want to do it every minute for the next 15 minutes, right? I want to run this, uh, you know, set interval for the next 15 minutes, collect me some data. And of course, after I run that, you know, because you know, it's kind of like any cooking show, <laughs> you know, I already pre-collected some of the data for you. Uh, so, you know, I started around this time and then this time. This is what we're going to submit to anomaly detector to identify if there are anomalies in our data set. Okay, so once I have that data, uh, I, of course, I, I use the anomaly detector uh, package to be able to talk to my, uh, to the API. Um, of course, this is some of the credentials. In order to, to call the API, there's two things that you would need. You need uh, API key and endpoint. In order to generate the API key and endpoint, you need to go, you know, use Azure CLI. If you go to Azure, you have to spin up a new version of anomaly detector or, you know, anomaly detector. That's the case. Okay. So, so once we do that, we can call the anomaly detector client. Okay. And then in, we're passing in the endpoint. It will give me the URL where to connect and the key in order to connect to that endpoint. And once we have that, we can call using detect last point, meaning the last, you know, looking at the last item on my uh, on my list is the last item. Sorry about this error. For some reason, it's giving me a different kind of error. But at least I can show you these. Um, so we specify, hey, every minute, every minute, I want to be able to uh, send the points, the series of points, and then detect is the last item on my list uh, anomalous or not. So once I call the API, it would give me something like this. You know, in this case, false. It would return false if the last point, you know, in this case, the last point is anomalous or not. And it's the same way as, um, so in this case, yeah, the last item on my list is not an anomaly. So we, we're talking about this and based from the data that you sent previously, or, you know, as a, you know. And then on this case, what I want to do, let me try to reload this real quick so that we would see if we can Get that error out. Of course, you know, it's live demo, so that's one of the reasons why it wouldn't show. Sometimes it might have some errors. But the good thing about this is at least I can give you some of the results after, you know, when I run it before. So in this case, okay. Give me some errors. Okay, let me see if I can. I also ran this same example uh, earlier in the day. So just in case, I, I wanted to show you what the results are. So my data set is like this. And what I wanted to do, right? We're going back to this since somehow the browser didn't show up properly. So I have my items and I want the last item. I want to force it to become uh, anomaly. So if, since I wanted to force to become an anomaly, I kind of add an item to it, meaning, you know, I set the time and that the last value, I change the time and then I change, you know, I add 100 to, to my item list. And then, and then in this case, I set the pixel. Uh, if, so, and then of course, in this case, I want you know sending this data set again, right? With the last item being instead of 39 degrees, maybe I send it as 139. I send it up to the API. And then based from that, 
if it detected as um, anomaly, it would set the pixel, meaning the the uh, my Raspberry Pi. It would set it to I don't know if you can see that X here. It would send it would send it uh, to a different color, and to say, hey, that last data is anomalous, and then it would give me that error. Uh, let me see if I can rerun it again. Just kind of attempt and see if I can, if it'll show up. Sometimes it would. Uh, see if we can run the last item on our list here. So give us some errors. Might be some network problems, of course. Uh, let's see if I can open that up. Okay. I go to the last item on my list. I want to run this one. Uh, but before I run it, I wanted to make sure, hopefully, uh, it will run. So we'll see what happens. The last item on my list, if it's if there's an anomaly or not, hopefully it will it will show. I don't know if you can see that. My lights are. <laughs> it's. <laughs> Because of my window, it's kind of harder to see, but it turned into X. That means the last item on our list, it was detected as anomalous, uh, row 15. And and then, of course, it showed that, hey, there, there is an anomaly there. And it sent an alert to my device. All right. Uh, I got two minutes left of my presentation. That's that goes. Isn't that cool? I don't know. What just happened, right? We collected some data from our, you know, using JavaScript, we collected some data from our uh, Raspberry Pi, be able to uh, call the API, and it tells us, hey, the last item on my list is anomaly, anomalous, and we are able to control uh, our uh, our sensors here and send the alert. That's the idea about it. So where can you use anomaly detector? Of course, there's C Sharp, JavaScript, and Python bindings. So if you want to do uh, libraries, so that if you want to call the API, it makes it easy for developers. You can also integrate it inside a Docker container. So if you're uh, if, if you're going through Kubernetes, you can you can do anomaly detector inside Kubernetes or inside your Docker Compose. Uh, Power BI, you can actually integrate this through your Power BI and Azure Databricks. Also, you can integrate that if you're looking at streaming data. One thing that's new, uh, I'm not going to be able to demo this, but you'll get the idea. Uh, it's also part of Azure Cognitive Services is uh, Metrics Advisor. But you think about it this way, right? You have all these database or data sources that you can collect, and then you can detect anomalies through this uh, SaaS platform. I would consider maybe a yeah, a SaaS platform, and then based from that, you can send alert, uh, and then identify later on what's the root cause of that alert. So it's it's a platform where you can you can do this, and it looks something like this, where you have all these different graphs, you know, that's connected to your data, and as you go identifying which ones are anomalous or not based from that data, once it sends alert, it kind of gives you that capability of being able to. You know, you have this incident hub, you can send that alerts and then you do your investigations uh, based from based from this. And like in this case, you know, it's your multi-variables, multi-types. Uh, if you think about this, in this case, it's looking at revenue or cost data that it would send alert if it suddenly there's a dip in your uh, a dip in your revenue or a spike in your in your cost, those kind of things. So that's what it's geared for. So at the end of the day, the best superpower that you can give to your project is what we call a spidey sense or anomaly detection. And if you're interested in uh, downloading or about the slides and about my information about this presentation, uh, you can. There's a QR code here, or you can go to my GitHub account and, and be able to download uh, you know, these. Python notebooks to, to verify and view or be able to run it locally. About myself, my name is Ron Dagdag. I'm a lead software engineer and AI edge specialist at uh, Spacey. I'm a Microsoft MVP. 
the best place to contact me is through Twitter or through email or you know, go through my, uh, connect me via LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the best way for me to connect. And um, if you're interested about my personal projects, dagdag.net. And I appreciate you geeking out with me about spidey senses, anomaly detection, uh, about you know Jupyter notebooks and about Raspberry Pi and Internet of Things device, all the, and of course about Spider-Man. Uh, and now that you're got bitten off by this spider, feel free to experiment and try out all these different tools that I just talked about. Any questions so far? Is that good? The topic. I'm ready for questions. Yeah, any questions out there? Interesting, interesting. Ron, that was fantastic. Uh, thank you for speaking to us. We really appreciate you. Um, we do have. Let me. Oh, let me get my. There we go. Okay. Uh, we do have uh, one question so far. Oh, and one comment just just to know this is really cool. That was a comment someone reached out for just so to know. <laughs> That's that great we, to hear. Uh, we are geeking out with you. Um, <laughs> not alone in that. That's awesome. Um, okay. So this is a question from David. Uh, do you think multiple detection systems working in tandem in order to be dynamic would be more precise? Or do you think doing that could start a whole new, would skew data towards a bias? Well, Anomaly detection is always looking at past histories, right? It's in, in terms of bias and what is the data set is kind of showing you, right? If you think about, you know, uh, what you're looking for here is like spikes or you're looking for uh, change levels or so something that would, that based from the historical data and on its current state, what, what is different, what is out of the ordinary. It does not tell you anything about in terms of, um, in terms of, I guess I can see that where you're, you're talking about bias in terms of bias, in terms of uh, identifying the out of the ordinary type. Uh, but that's that's the, the, the algorithm itself. Having multiple variables, the better your anomaly detection might be because of that. Uh, because you're not just looking at one uh, data set, but we're looking at multiple, so the less error it can have. Does that make sense? Or does that answer your question? I think I think you covered it. Um, we did have one other one, and that uh, was the workbook uh, that you were showing during your demo on Git. Uh, they were curious about the Python code. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's on that uh, GitLab, uh, or it, it's on GitHub. Um, I, I have some few ex instructions there. I still need to improve the instructions and how to set this up. Uh, but uh, the the library that I'm using is uh, the app is TS Lab, and it tells you how to install it. Uh, so I guess you have to have Python Notebook in order to install that, or Jupyter Notebook. I mean, Jupyter Notebook in order to install it in your local machine, and of course you you add the new kernel uh, to it, and the the kernel is called TS Lab. And, and then it allows you to have a JavaScript kernel or a, a TypeScript kernel in the background, and then you can you can uh, integrate it too. Yeah. And uh, the cool thing is, one thing I found out is you can also have it inside Visual Studio Code, and I thought that was that was interesting. Uh, I don't know if you saw that in, as part of my demo. You can actually have uh, you know Python notebooks or Jupyter notebooks inside uh, inside the you know, Visual Studio Code and be able to kind of, you know, work with your data as you go, you know, those kind of things, and then run the application. So anyway, thought it's, it's interesting <laughs> to talk about. It. Excellent. I'll, I'll have them follow up with you about that because that's something I think they might want to set up on their own machine. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, Especially when you're teaching, this is very useful, right? Because you can start experimenting, going back to the code. It, oh, oh, yeah. The advantage of it is, the result is under that you know code, and of course you can add uh, markdowns also on this to give explanation. For sure, um, I think that's all the questions we have for you uh, right now. But um, I think you covered it at the very end. But just double checking, where's the best place for people to get a hold of you? Uh, LinkedIn and Twitter would be the best uh, way to contact me. 
Well, we really appreciate it. And then uh, our next talk will happen in eight minutes at 3.15. Uh, we'll see you then. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.